Romans chapter 12. And this is just something that the Holy Spirit has been working on the inside of me really over the past couple weeks because a few weeks ago I was studying the Word and I was studying through the book of Colossians. And if you haven't downloaded or purchased a copy of the Passion Translation, I, I highly recommend it. Um, if you have a Bible app, I use, um, I, I use the Olive Tree Bible app. I use uh, Logos is the one I use more than anything right now. And I think you can download the Passion Translation. It's on the Logos app. It's $10. But it is such a different... And I'm going to read some of those. I'm going to share some of those out of that translation tonight. But I was studying through the book of Colossians. And there's an area of Scripture in Colossians chapter 3 where it talks about, basically, don't let the devil trick you into getting caught up in what's going on in this planet. You know, I use the illustration, and I, I don't have a better one. It's why I keep using the same one. But whenever we travel to a foreign country, I mean, if you remember a few years ago, I think it was eight years ago, nine years ago now, uh, Pastor Callahan and I went to India. Um, we found out, um, John Paul is the one that invited us to come in, and he said, look, just get a tourist visa. Um, that's all you have to apply for. Get a tourist visa. You come here and preach. And we were going to minister at that time, really, ever, the largest crowd we would ever be in front of. The crowd that was going to be over 10,000 people. And so we did the tourist visa. We did everything we were supposed to do. We get to the church to begin to minister. And we find out it is against the law to preach in, a, in India on a tourist visa. We didn't know that. We just went with what we were told. I didn't do any research. Didn't see any need to. And, and you know, God supernaturally delivered us from that. When I called the embassy about um, helping us because they wouldn't let us out of the church compound because there were people there waiting to put us in jail. And when I called the U.S. embassy, um, he said, he said, Jim, I'm sorry, there's nothing I can do for you. You've broken the law. And he said, I, it'd be bad if they put you in jail, but he said, but this really helped. He said, what concerns me is a militant Hindu crowd beating you to death. And I said, well, thank you. I'm glad I called because I hadn't thought of that one. And so we didn't know. We didn't know the laws of the nation. We didn't know what we were supposed to do. So I do a lot more research now. I find out enough about that country so that while we're there, we don't get in trouble. I find out if I need a visa, what kind of visa I need, and all those things. <clears throat> but I don't do enough research to find out what it would be like to live there. Because I'm not going there to live. I'm just going to visit and I'm coming home. And the problem in the church world is most Christians are studying the kingdom of God like it's just someplace they're going to visit, just enough to get by. But I mean, this is where we're going to live for eternity. Yeah. And so what the devil is working to do is to get you so caught up in this life now. And when you take, look, the Bible promises us 120 years. The days of a man will be 120 years. And the 120 seems like a long time, but you put that against eternity... Isn't it interesting how the older you get, the quicker time seems to go by? Yeah. Do you remember as a kid and your parents would tell you we're going on vacation this summer and it was forever to get to summer? Now, do you realize we're less than two months away from 2020? It's going to be a great year. That's mind-boggling to me that we're almost at the end of 2019. And because the more years you have, the quicker time goes by because six months now at 54 years old is a very small percentage of how long I've been alive. But when you're seven or eight years old, six months, that's a pretty large percentage of your lifetime. And so what the devil is working to do is to, and when you think about that, 120 years, let me get back to the point I was making when you take 120 years, it seems now like a long time, but 120 years into eternity is nothing. That's why the psalmist said, look, your life is just like a wafer. It's just like a grass that comes and now it's gone. Not that you're going to live a short life, but against eternity. Well, Pastor, what are you trying to say? Why do we get so caught up in what's going on in this life when an eternity is a whole lot longer than we're going to spend our lives? And so that's what I want to deal with tonight. I want you to see that being born again, you have been rescued from this present world. Now we're just passing through. Yeah. 
We're just, we're, the Bible calls it Abraham was just a sojourner in this land. The children of Israel, when God called them out of Egypt, supernaturally brought them out of Egypt and took them through the wilderness to take them into the promised land. That journey should have taken no more than three weeks. That's a baby, for, and that included going to the mount to receive the Ten Commandments, offering the sacrifices. Should have been a three-week journey, but they ended up in it for forty years because that's what they centered on. And remember what we talked about on Sunday. Paul wrote to the church at Corinth and said those things were given to us as examples, so that we wouldn't make the same mistake. And it's what the devil works to do with us. To get us so caught up in present circumstances, so caught up on what's going on right now, so caught up in there's no way this will ever change, that this is the way it's always going to be. That's the way it was before. That's the way it's going to be in the future. Who do you think you are that it's going to be different for you? And so Roman, we've got to understand, Romans chapter 12, let's, let's get into this. He says in verse number 2, and I know this is a very familiar scripture to us, but he says, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. We have to change the way we think. And understand, it doesn't say, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by getting born again. Pastor, are you saying we shouldn't get born again? That's not what I'm saying at all. But getting born again is your spirit man coming back into communion, into covenant with God, but you still have the same flesh, you still have the same mind. And it's why so many Christians have a difficult time. They give their life to Jesus, and they go right back to their old way of living. Because they're not doing anything to change the way they think. They're not sitting under teaching that's changing the way, they're think, way they think. They're being told, well, this is God's plan for your life. Whatever happens was going to happen. Just make the best of it. He says, don't be conformed to this world, <coughs> Excuse me, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. My favorite translation of verse number two is out of what's called the Phillips translation. And he says, don't let the world around you squeeze you into its old mold. I love the way he says that. Because we are constantly bombarded with information of what we're supposed to be like. I, I, I get in trouble for saying this, but you know, I could care less. Love, we're, we're being bombarded with information that we're running out of everything. Look, every day of creation, God created the heavens and the earth. Every day of creation, He ended the day with, it is good. And I choose to believe what God says about our earth instead of what man is telling us. Uh, John Evanzini years ago wrote a book, and it's called The Wealth of the World. And in that book, The Wealth of the World, he talks about all of the natural resources that are on this planet. Isn't it amazing? I, I don't care what you believe about where dinosaurs came from or what happened to dinosaurs. It, we're not going to argue about it. But isn't it amazing that man says crude oil came from dinosaurs that died and decayed? Now, whether you believe that or not, it doesn't matter. But what's amazing to me is God knew we were going to need gasoline and oil and made sure crude oil was in this earth, even before man knew we would ever need it. So I'm not worried. I'm not concerned about running out of anything. But So we've got this mentality of, you know, um, the church is dying and, and people are leaving churches and what difference does it make? You're not going to change anything. We've got that, all that information being given to us to squeeze us into their mold. But I love this. It says, but let God remold your minds from within. Get the word on the inside of you. So that you may prove and practice that the plan of God for you is good, meets all his demands, and moves toward the goal of true maturity. I love that translation. Now go to Colossians chapter 1. <clears throat> Colossians chapter 1. Now, it's talking about what happens to us when we're born again. It's what happens to us. See, brother, before you're born again, every decision you make is based, is based on what your flesh wants. And then you get born again. And the Bible lets us know before we're born again, we are serving our father, the devil. 
That's amazing to me. That's what it says. You're serving. Now, I don't know about you, but before I got born again, there was no question that's who I was serving. I did what he wanted me to do. Didn't realize that. I thought I was just doing what I wanted to do. But it says, look at Colossians chapter 1 and verse number 13. I love this. He rescued us from the domain of darkness. I love that picture. I love, I, I love the idea that that gives, that Jesus came and he snatched us out of darkness domain. He rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son. So we were living in the kingdom of darkness and the Bible says Jesus came and rescued us and transferred us or transplanted us into the kingdom of his dear son. So we're not in the kingdom of darkness anymore. As a matter of fact, um, go with me. Let, me. let me look up this verse. Go with me to Ephesians. I believe that the area that I want is Ephesians chapter 4. <clears throat> yeah, let's go to Ephesians chapter 4, verse number 1. He says, there I for the prisoner of the Lord implore you, I beg you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling wherewith you've been called. Paul is letting us know when you get born again, you should be a completely different person. And he says, I'm begging you to walk according to what you've been called to. And let's go down to um, verse number 14. Talking about the fivefold ministry gifts, he's given the apostle, the prophet, the evangelist, the pastor, and the teacher for the equipping of the saints. As a result, verse number 14, that we are no longer children tossed here and there by waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men, by the craftiness of deceitful schemings. Go down to verse number 17. This is what happens when we've been translated from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of his dear son. We've been taken out of this world's domain and placed in God's domain. See, I'm no longer bound by, by, the, by the, hear me all the way out on this. I'm no longer bound by the natural laws of this earth. Because we're in the kingdom of heaven now. My spirit man, me, who is, who is the real me, has been translated out of the kingdom of darkness. And I've now been placed in the kingdom of his dear son. And so Paul starts to talk about in verse number 17, here's how you should live. So this I say and affirm together with the Lord that you walk no longer just as the Gentiles also walk. In the futility of their mind, being darkened in their understanding, excluded from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them. <clears throat> and he goes down and says, but you didn't learn Christ this way in verse number 20. Go down to verse number 23. We're talking about, we're, we've, we're, we're not in the kingdom of darkness. We don't think like darkness anymore. We've been translated into the kingdom of his dear son. And he says, verse 23, that you be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Just like he says in Romans 12 too, he says you need to renew your mind. In, in Ephesians 4, 23, he says now you've got to renew the spirit of your mind. Get it down on the inside of you where it becomes first nature to you and put on the new self. Put on the new man which in the likeness of God has been created in righteousness and holiness of the truth. You have been made to be just like God. Well, isn't that what he said back in Genesis chapter 1? He said, I'm going to make man in my image and after my likeness. And go back to Colossians. <clears throat> Colossians chapter 1 and verse number 13 again. He says, he rescued us from the domain of darkness. Let's put a different word in there. Instead of domain, he rescued us from the dominion of darkness. Darkness has no dominion over us. Has no authority to us anymore unless we give it to him. That's the only authority the devil has in your life is authority that you give him, which is the message that I taught on Sunday. God had placed a hedge around Job and things that Job did lowered the hedge and it gave Satan the right to come and attack Job. Let me read this verse out of the Amplified. I want to read a couple different translations. He says in verse number, Colossians 1.13 in the Amplified, he says, The Father has delivered and drawn us to himself, I love this, out of the control and the, the dominion of darkness, and has transferred us into the kingdom of the Son of his love. 
Now the message. I love some of the message translation. I love the way that it words things. Verse 13, God rescued us from the dead end alleys and dark dungeons. I love that. Because I don't know about you, before I got born again, I was in a dead end alley and some dark dungeons. He set us up in the kingdom of the son he loves so much. Verse 14, the son who got us out of the pit we were in got rid of the sins we were doomed to keep repeating. I love that. Now go with me to Colossians chapter 3. See, we're not, we're not subject. We're not bound by the limitations of this world. You think about it. You go through the Old Testament and, and the New Testament and look at the miracles that God did. Look, think about it. When the children of Israel came out of Egypt and got to the Red Sea, God told Moses, stretch forth your rod, go forward. And the Red Sea parted, broke natural law with supernatural truth. And the Bible says there was a wall of water on the left and a wall of water on the right, and the children of Israel walk through on dry ground. And it amazes me, still to this day, how man try to, men try to explain that away. Well, they walked through the Red Sea because it was at low tide. No, God says there was a wall of water on the right, a wall of water on the left, and they walked through on dry ground. But okay, you want to believe it was low tide, and they walked through on ankle deep water? It's fine with me. It's a great miracle because God drowned the Egyptian army in ankle-deep water. <laughs> Joshua. Well, I mean, then they get out into the wilderness and God says, don't worry, I'm going to take care of you. And every morning and every night, the Bible says, like dew, manna appeared. That's what it says. We talk about dew with manna raining down from heaven, but literally it says manna will appear like dew. Now, how did it get there? You know, you know there was an Israelite, especially the kids watching. How did it get here? We have no idea. He gives no explanation, but supernaturally every single day. And even when the children of Israel complained about it, we're tired of men and we want something different. The, great, the greatest quail hunt in history. The Bible says they had quail up until the horse's bridles. They ate so much quail it was coming out of their nose. Now, we're just a few weeks away from Thanksgiving, and you know what it means to eat so much it comes out of your nose. That's a lot of quail. Then they need water, and God says, strike the rock. They're in the middle of the desert, and God says, strike the rock. Moses strikes the rock with his rod, and water begins to pour out of the rock. There was no natural limitation to what God could do. Joshua leads the children of Israel. They come out of the wilderness. They're going into the promised land. And God says, now I want you to do it different. Don't stretch forth your rod. You step into the water. Get the feet of the priests to step into the water that are carrying the Ark of the Covenant. And the Bible says, as soon as they stepped in, the waters of the Jordan were stopped and heaped up on themselves. I don't know if there's video in heaven, but that's what I want to see. The Jordan River flows, some people believe, and I have a tendency to agree with it, the reason that Jericho was so afraid of Israel is because they saw the Jordan. Can you imagine looking out over the walls of your city and there's the Jordan River going straight up and two and a half, three million people walking over on dry ground? That might put fear in the hearts of some people. Supernaturally, Elijah... <clears throat> Had, or Elisha has so much anointing in his bones. They threw a dead soldier in his grave on top of him, and the dead soldier came back to life. Now, can you imagine those other soldiers? They've thrown him in the pit. Elisha's bones are in there, and the guy jumps back up, and he's back in line. And that was Old Testament. That was Old Covenant. And they have a better covenant. I love, one, one, of my favorite, one of the favorite to me, uh, the stories in the Old Testament is Elisha. When the king is coming against Israel, and every time he has a plan of attack, God tells Elisha, who tells the king of Israel, this is what he's going to do. And finally the king calls in his, his counselors and says, all right, I want to know which one of you is for the king of Israel. Because everything we come up with, the king of Israel knows about it. And one of his counselors says, king, now, there's a man of God that hears what you say in your bedchamber. And so they go out to kill Elisha. And so Gehazi gets up in the morning. 
The servant of Elisha goes out and looks, and their camp is surrounded by the, by the Assyrian army. And Elisha prays and says, Lord, open his eyes. Because he told him, he says, there's more with us than are with you. That's a man that understands. I'm not in this natural world. I'm in, let me, say, let me rephrase that. I'm in this natural world, but I'm not of it. Yeah. I have a higher kingdom that I'm serving. And that's an Old Testament prophet. And so he prays and says, Lord, open his eyes. And can you, I, I, I would love to have seen the look on his servant's face when Elisha says, open his eyes. No, 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 I'm going to close my eyes. I don't want to see this. But when you understand the truth of the word, you can look right at the problem and see the promise of God. That's the place we have to get to. We have, if the doctor's report comes, you can look right at that doctor's report and say, you know what? That's what the doctor said. But by his stripes, I'm healed. You can look right at your bank account and say, I know that's what my bank account says, but wealth and riches are in my house. You can have a, a loved one or a family member that's not serving God, and you can look right in their face as they're cursing you. They're sold out to God because I'll be saved and my household. Amen. Amen. That's what, I mean, that's understanding. I'm in this world, but I'm not of it. See, these natural laws don't apply to me. They didn't apply to Jesus, did they? No. Did natural law apply to Jesus? The man walked on the water. Amen. Peter, for a short time, walked on the water. That's breaking natural law. The devil constantly works to get our minds to dwell on the circumstances. That's what he's constantly trying to get us to do. Colossians chapter 3. Oh, I love this. He says, therefore, if you have been raised up with Christ, if you've been born again, if you've given your life to Jesus, keep seeking the things above. What does that mean? I remember when I first got born again, um, there was a guy at the church and, you know, he was so caught up in the things of God and, and so caught up in his prayer life and his word life and, and evangelism and all that stuff. And I remember one of his family members telling him, you have become too, earthly mi or too heavenly minded to be any earthly good. I'm, I'm a brand new Christian. I'm thinking, that's not possible. But has anybody else ever heard somebody say that? They're just too heavenly minded. Got their head up in the clouds. He tells me, therefore, if you have been raised up with Christ, keep seeking the things above. You know what? I know what that's, that's what the news says. What are we headed towards? We're headed toward revival because that's what God says. Keep, keep seeking the things above where Christ is. Seated at the right hand of God. Verse 2, set your mind on the things above, not on the things that are on the earth. Does it make you think of any other scripture that Paul wrote, maybe to the church at Corinth, when he said, we don't look at the things which are seen? Verse 2, Colossians chapter 3, verse 2. Set your mind on the things above, not on the things that, on the, that are on the earth. It looks to me I'm supposed to be heavenly minded. It looks to me like I'm supposed to be caught up in what God says about this. Oh, you're just denying the truth. No, no, no. The fact is, I'm going to a higher form of truth. The fact may be, here's what the doctor says, but the truth is, he sent his word to heal me. The fact may be, there is no way in the natural for this to happen. But the truth is, God said, that's all I need. Set your mind on the things above, not on the things that are on the earth. For you have died. <clears throat> and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, is revealed, then you also we, we, be, will be revealed with Him in glory. Now, re let me read those verses. Verses 1 through 4 out of the Passion Translation. I, listen, I, I want you to listen to this. I have this printed out. I have it taped to my refrigerator. I have it taped to my bathroom mirror. I have it taped to my office at home. I love this. Christ, resurrection, is your resurrection too. That is why we are to yearn for all that is above. For that's where Christ sits, enthroned at the place of all power, honor, and authority. Yes, feast on all the treasures of the heavenly realm. And I love this. Fill your thoughts with heavenly realities and not with the distractions of the natural realm. I want to, I want to read that part again. 
He says, verse number two, yes, feast on all the treasures of the heavenly realm and fill your thoughts with heavenly realities. Isn't it amazing? You start thinking about those things and the devil comes at you like, that's not really true. That's not real. You can't, you can't, that's not ever going to happen for you. Fill your thoughts with heavenly realities and not with the, dis listen to this, not with the distractions of the natural realm. Look, and I'm going to keep reading, but that's what jumped out at me when I read this verse in the Passion Translation. Not with the distractions of the natural realm. And when you understand that's what the devil's doing with the attacks that he brings, with the accusations that he brings, with the symptoms that he's bringing, he's trying to distract you with this natural realm. It's funny, I, I, I know I, I talk about him, but every morning I take my 80-pound dog for a walk. And it's just funny to me when little dogs bark at him. He could care less. I would love to know what some of the dogs say when they're barking. Because there's some, he'll just ignore, but there's others, oh, he's got to get to them. But the little dogs, he doesn't care. It's funny, we've got, we've got this 80-pound Bouvier, and we have this 10-pound Shih Tzu. And they'll go at each other. And when he's done with her, he just puts his paw on top of her. And that's it. He's done. I won't mess with you no more. <laughs> and she'll do everything. She'll bite at his ankles. She'll, she'll jump. He'll be laying there. She'll just run across the room and jump on top of him. And all he does is just roll, put his paw on top of her. I'm done. Don't be distracted with this natural realm. Verse number three, listen to this. Your crucifixion with Christ has severed the tie to this life. And now your true life is hidden away in God, in Christ. And as Christ himself is seen for who he really is, who you really are will also be revealed. For you are now one with him in his glory. I'm telling you, I love those four verses in the Passion Translation. Go with me to Galatians chapter one. <clears throat> Galatians chapter 1. It, it, it's, I, I understand there's people that feel like they're supposed to and, and people that are caught up in it. But beloved, I don't know how as a believer you sit and watch the news. I don't know how as a believer you sit and watch it all day long and listen all day long. And, and I'm just talking about me. I don't. I, God has a way to tell me what's going on. I can tell you everything that's going on in the world, everything's going on in the natural. But man, you get so caught up in that, it tells me to disconnect from this natural realm. Disconnect from that and connect with my heavenly reality. And I've told you before, I had a, I had a relative, we were, we were at their house and they were sitting there watching the news and it was, it was amazing to me because it was wars and rumors of wars and nation rising against nation, and exactly what Jesus said was going to happen. And they looked at me just really concerned, and they said, what's this world coming to? I said, revival. God is not surprised by anything that's going on. But we cannot sit. I love one of my favorite quotes that William Bump has ever said is, why are you surprised, sin or sin? People are getting so angry with what heathen politicians are doing. Look at the Word. <coughs> They're doing exactly what the Word says they were going to do. Yeah. Everything in their agenda is to form a one world government, just like God said. <coughs> we shouldn't be sitting here shocked. What are they doing? I can't believe they think this way. It's the devil. And it's playing right into God's hands. He thinks he's winning. That's what's so funny. He actually, I, but if you get so caught up in that, oh, I don't understand what we're going to do. We're going to have to build a cave. That's what we're going to do. We're going to get a cave. We're going to, we're, well, man, I'm, I'm building a fallout shelter. I'm going to start storing up water and toilet paper. That's all you need. Water and toilet paper. We'll be fine. And, and, and that was the thing that amazed me. <clears throat> At Y2K, when we were going from 1999 to the year 2000, 
where everybody tried to tell us everything was going to stop working and you, you're going to go underground and you better store up water. And I knew people that had gallon jugs of water. You put a teaspoon of, of Clorox in it to make sure that the water doesn't go bad, and, but you got to have water stored up. People were making millions of dollars selling um, MREs, meal ready to eat, so you could store those away forever because we're going under. And I remember having a conversation with somebody that was doing that. And I said, I'm going to ask you something. I said, let's just say, for instance, you're right. I do not agree with you. What you're saying is going to happen is not going to happen. I'm telling you that. But let me ask you something. Are you a Christian? And they said, yeah. I said, so if everything stops, which it's not going to, but if everything stops working and you're the only one on your block that has food, are you going to watch everybody else starve or do what Jesus said and feed the poor. You want to know what they said? That's the story of the ten virgins. We're the five that prepared. They're the five that did. And that is, I said, that is not what that's talking about. I said, you're going to sit there inside your compound and watch everybody around you starve. Well, they didn't want to talk to me anymore. I'm just going to go by what the book says. My attitude always was, you know what, if my God's not big enough to take care of me, I am serving the wrong God. I'm not getting caught up in what's going on around here. You know who benefited from Y2K? We had, at the time, we had a missionary in Mexico, and in about February of 2000, he was like, I am so thankful for all that teaching about Y2K. He said, I've gotten food rations, I've gotten generators, I've gotten all kinds of water because people had stored it up and now they don't need it. Galatians chapter 1. Man, if we would just stick to the book, it would keep us out of so much stupidity. Galatians chapter 1, and verse number 3. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave, look at verse number 4, who gave himself for our sins. See, beloved, when you go study the book of Romans, in Romans chapter 4, it says, If sin entered the world through one man, and therefore death, then through one man, sin can be taken out. All the problems in the world, all the trouble, all the sin, all the disease, all the sickness came because Adam sinned. One man sinned and brought it all to us. And because it came through one man, one man can come and take care of it. That's why it's so important, 1 Peter 2, 24, you don't just go to by his stripes on heel. He himself bore our sin so that by his stripes you'd be healed. See, sin is what brought sickness in. Sin problem take, being taken care of is why sickness has no place. Who gave himself, verse 4, for our sins that he might rescue us from this present evil age according to the will of God and our Father. I love that. He took our sin to rescue us from the present evil age. This present evil age ain't got nothing to do with me. Doesn't have anything to do with you. Go to 2 Peter chapter 1. 2 Peter chapter 1. We were actually down on Main Street. In our, in our second building when we started the church here when the Holy Spirit began to deal with me about 2 Peter chapter 1 look at what he says here verse number 2 grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord seeing that his divine power has granted to us everything I love that that his divine power has granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness through the true knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and excellence. Now look at verse number four. For by these he has granted to us his precious and magnificent promises, so that by them you might be partakers of the divine nature. The last part of verse number four is where I'm headed. Having escaped the corruption that's in this world by lust. I've, I've escaped it. I am not subject to the corruption that's in this world. It doesn't affect me. I remember I began to get a hold of that, began to understand it. Go me to John chapter 17 and really began to work it. Now, I've escaped the corruption. And I realized 
If that's true, then the corruption doesn't affect my stuff either. And so we began to work it over the things we own. We began to work it over our vehicles. And <clears throat> the last vehicle we had before the current ones we own was a 2001 Chevy Suburban. And when it finally gave up the ghost, how many years ago now? I guess it's about seven years ago now. It had 498,000 miles on it. And every time I would talk to people, they're like, There's, what have you done to it? No major mechanical work to it at all. Nothing, I mean, the, the normal maintenance on it, the little things being replaced, but nothing major was ever done to it. And no mechanic could believe it. No car lot could believe it. I remember when it died at 498,000 miles, 497,000 miles. Pastor Jack said, let's tow it around for 3,000 miles. You need to break half a million on this. I had it towed to my house. I, was, I could have fixed it. It needed a new transmission. That's what went bad on it. And I felt that it was time to get rid of it. I remember I called Pastor Jack, and he had a Tahoe. Still does. He still got, has a Chevy Tahoe. I said, look, you can come get anything you want off of my Suburban. I'm selling it as junk. It was like 10 below. And I come home, and Pastor Jack is out there in a snowsuit. <laughs> And there are parts all over my driveway. All that was left was the block of that engine. So that, that's what I'm saying is that Suburban is still living on. Heart, in his. Heart transplant. We had a heart transplant. <laughs> but I remember when, I, when I saw that, having escaped the corruption that's in this world. Look, I, I like new stuff. Don't misunderstand me. But if there's something you want to hang on to... It'll last as long as you want it to last because we've escaped that corruption. We've escaped. Uh, let me read that. First, um, 2 Peter chapter 1. And, and I want to go to some different translations. Let me give me a second here just to look this up. The King James says, having escaped the corruption that is in this world by lust. Um, I don't think that was King James, was it? That's funny. They're not showing up. It's not The version isn't showing up. Oh, well. Go, John chapter 17. Let me, let me. <clears throat> Look what Jesus says. John chapter 17, and let's go to verse number 14. He says, I have given them your word, and the world has hated them. Because, listen, because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. I do not ask you to take them out of the world, but to keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. That's why we say it. We're in it, but we're not of it. The first trip that I made to Angola... I've never seen poverty like what I saw in the country of Angola. And one of the things that just it's made such an impression on me, we drove from um, northern Angola to southern, to in, really into central Angola, from um, Luanda, um, am I saying that right? Yeah, to Manal. And we drove for six hours, well actually we took a six hour trip and we crammed it into nine hours. <clears throat> But we drove for hours and saw nothing. And then every so often you would see a hut out in the middle of nowhere. And the thought just kept going through my mind, there are people out here that are going to be born, live their entire life and die, and no one will ever know it. Because there's nobody around. But I saw poverty there like I have never seen in my life. And I had to... I, um, when, when you travel to another country, you're supposed to tell the embassy that you're there. But I wanted to make, to get a, a, a rapport going with the embassy because we wanted pastors to come to the U.S. to come to one of our conferences. So I made an appointment and we went to the U.S. embassy. And it was amazing because all around in Luanda, all this, it was all poverty. It was, I mean, it was trash everywhere. You could see how poor the area was. 
and I showed my U.S. passport, and I walked through the gate, and, and literally, I was in the United States as soon as I stepped across that gate, and it was night and day. Everything was top of the line. Every building was nice, manicured. There wasn't any grass outside the gates, but inside was manicured lawns and bushes and flowers. It was like, I, I mean, I had stepped into the United States, but it was like I was back home. I was in Angola, but see, I'm not from there. I'm in it, but I'm not of it. That's what Jesus is saying. I, 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 I quoted this verse earlier, but go to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. This is what it all boils down to. When we send an ambassador to another nation, his lifestyle is not based on the nation where he's, where he's placed. His, his finances, his economy, is based on the economy here in the United States. When we have an embassy, it doesn't matter what nation it's in, doesn't matter what country it's in, doesn't matter what the conditions are around them, inside that wall, inside those gates, it is the United States of America, and everything in there is based on our economy here. And if we could understand that, we're in this world, but we're not of it. I, I, I want to read that again. I... I out of the, the Passion Translation. He says, Feast on all the treasures of the heavenly realm and fill your thoughts with heavenly realities and not with the distractions of the natural realm. I can't tell you the feeling that came across me to walk through the gates of that U.S. Embassy and know that I was in America. No matter what was going on around me, no matter what things looked like outside those walls, at that moment, I was an American citizen in America. That's how, when you get to 2 Corinthians chapter 4, we don't look at the things which are seen. Just like Paul told the church at Colossae, keep your, keep your mind on heavenly realm. Keep your mind on the promises of God. Don't be distracted by what's going on in this natural realm. We have a realm. When you understand... Genesis chapter 1, verse number 1. What's the first verse in the Bible say? In the beginning. Okay, let's go back and look at that. Put Genesis chapter 1. What did it say, Pastor? Genesis chapter 1. It says, in the be just, just the first four words, what's it say? In the beginning, God. You can go to John chapter 1. Put up John chapter 1, verse number 1. <clears throat> in the beginning was the... Word. So it says, in the beginning was God. In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was God. And the, or the Word was with God. And the Word was God. So in the beginning we have the Word. Everything came out of in the beginning God. In the beginning of the Word, and after all this natural realm is gone, God's still going to be there, the Word's still going to be there, that is what is the most real. That's what we need to center on. That's how you can say it. We don't look at the things which are seen, but the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal. They're temporary. They're subject to change. But the things which are not seen are eternal. Lord, I... I I almost, I, I know I say this a lot, but look, find out the things in your life that you're not satisfied with. Find out the things in your life you want to change. We live in a society that loves to talk about what's wrong. Loves to be critical. And we've got to stop doing that and look at, okay, I want this to change. All I need is a truth from the Word <coughs> that I can stand on that will change it. Because if you keep talking what is, you're going to keep having what is. Mm -hmm. So find a promise. I was talking to someone just the other day, and they gave me all this list of things that they fear. And I said, oh, what I'm going to do, send me the list, and I will send you a scripture to stand on. Because that's what we have to do. I'm not looking at what's seen. I'm keeping my mind on the heavenly realm. Yeah. Let me read this out of the New Living, and we'll, we'll, we'll wrap it up here. 2 Corinthians 4.18 
I love, I love the way the New Living says this. So we don't look at the troubles we can see now. And listen, love the Bible lets us know we've got trouble on every side. That's what Paul said. We got trouble on every side. You understand, Pastor? You understand what it's like where I am. What you're going through, according to the word, is common to man. So stop thinking you're the exception. Stop thinking it's different for you. Well, it's easy for him because. It's easy for them because. I, I can't tell how many times I've heard, well, Pastor, it's easy for you to believe for prosperity because people so do you. You're a pastor. Well, I could say it's easy for you because you can work longer. See, there's always something you can put in your mind to make you believe it's easier for somebody else. So we don't look at the troubles we can see now. Rather, we fix our gaze on things that cannot be seen. For the things we see now will soon be gone, but the things we cannot see will last forever. Everything we can see came out of the Word, and Jesus said it. It is easier for heaven and earth to disappear than for the smallest promise in His Word not to come to pass. I'm going to stand on that. I'm going to stick to what God says, regardless of what it looks like, regardless of what I feel like, regardless of what's going on around me, I'm going to stick to what God says. Yeah. And I'm going to see what He says come to pass. Amen? <laughs> Hallelujah. Let's stand. Hallelujah. He's a faithful God. And He will do what He said He'll do. Well, let's go back. Let's, let's do just a, just a course of worship.